everybody. My name is Brady Henderson, and I serve as the senior pastor in the First Baptist Church of Gaston, South Carolina, located here in the beautiful Midlands of, in my opinion, the greatest state in the Union. And I'm here today uh, with Alan Ott on the Menorah Podcast. Say hey to him, Al. Hey, guys, and I agree with you. This is the best state in the Union. <laughs> Uh, so for those that are listening, maybe for the first time, maybe you're catching up for the second time, wherever the case is, uh, the purpose of the Menorah podcast is to uh, share the light, speak the light, and send the light of Jesus Christ all across the airwaves of the internet through podcast ministry. And so uh, what we're going to do today is we have not done one of these in a while, Alan, but you and I were talking not too long ago. Uh, and so today's episode, the 32nd episode of the Menorah podcast is kind of birthed out of our discipleship group lesson on Sunday. I am uh, teaching discipleship group number two, which is an intro into Baptist history in South Carolina. And so, Alan, I thought we would do, uh, and by the way, I'm going to put you on the spot today. Uh, you're going get to get get a few pop quizzes from <laughs> Sunday's lesson. but uh, That could be bad. <laughs> I wanted to do a... Um, a pastor profile episode. We haven't done one of those in a while uh, since before homecoming. I want to do a pastor profile episode on William Screven, uh, and I'll get into him in a second. Um, and so, but he was a pastor. Uh, and by the way, um, some of you may have heard of him. I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you most of you have not. <laughs> so he was the first pastor of a Baptist church in the South. He was the founding pastor and the first pastor of the First Baptist Church in Charleston. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm going to pull a good bit from what we talked about in D groups on Sunday. So if you are in my D group and you're listening to today's lesson, you can listen to it, or today's episode. You can listen to it again, but you already know most of this. So maybe some of the questions I, I ask Alan today, you can answer on your own at home as you listen to this. So William Screven, just to kind of catch our listeners up, he founded First Baptist Charleston back in 1696, and we'll talk about him a little bit more in depth. But before we do that, Alan, I want to back up and pun a second, and I want to talk about the very first Baptist in America. Now, his name was Roger Williams, and so he came over here and settled in Massachusetts. And can you remember the religious, religious group that was prominent in Massachusetts in the 1630s and 40s? Well, that would be the Puritans. Yeah, there you go. One for one, Alan. Uh, the Puritans. And so just to give our listeners an idea on the doctrine of the Puritans, uh, you know, they came over here for religious freedom. The reason they're called the Puritans is because they sought to have a pure church free of the impurities that the English church had, right? So that was a big deal to them. That was something that they thought a lot about. And so anyway, Roger Williams comes over and how Roger Williams becomes a Baptist is he hears about the trial of a lady named Anne Hutchinson. And so we talked about this Sunday in my class. And so Anne Hutchinson uh, was a lady who if you look her up online, the number one thing that is going to come up about her is that she was the very first feminist in America. And as I talked about on Sunday, I disagree with the title feminist. Maybe maybe for that time in culture, she was considered a feminist. But to you and I, she was a lady who stood up and spoke her mind and fought for the truth, which to me is a big difference from a modern day feminist. So Anne Hutchinson speaks out because the Puritans at that time in Massachusetts believed that you could, you could be saved by good works, which most denominations at that time were like that, including the Catholic Church in England. And so Anne Hutchinson speaks out in a worship service and says, no, that's not true. She quotes scripture. And so the leaders of the church didn't like the fact that she was speaking out. And so she was actually banned, not just from the church, banned from the state of Massachusetts. And Alan, we talked about on Sunday how even though the that Europeans uh, and English settlers came to the Americas for religious freedom, we talked about how they actually didn't have religious freedom when they came. Did you know that before the class Sunday? Was that a new idea to you? And, and what, what's your thoughts on that? Because that's a common misconception. Yes, I did think that that is exactly the reason they came and that's exactly what they got. It never occurred to me that there would be any carrying over of the old ways, but I can see I can see that cause. I mean, you've done something all your life a certain way 
Yeah. And you're going somewhere to start a new, probably one of the first things you're going to try to do is create what you had yep. um, in your previous uh, life, so to speak. And, and I think, you know, to add to that, that's very true, but I also think it has a lot to do with the fact that England still wanted control of the Americas. And so every province, every uh, colonial state had a governor and had, you know, English, uh, not policemen, but English enforcers. And so right. that was still going on, which that's that's going to happen all the way up until 17, 1776, the Revolutionary War and all that. So anyway, so Anne Hutchinson speaks out. She gets banished. Uh, she and her husband... And she was married, but she and her husband, in 1638, they leave and they go, they relocate to modern day New York. And in 1643, she and all of her children, but one daughter, uh, were killed in an Indian massacre. Now, we talked about this Sunday, the first conspiracy theory in America. uh, And I don't believe in this conspiracy theory, by the way is that Anne Hutchinson was not killed by actual Native Americans. She was killed by Puritans dressed up as Native Americans. I don't think that's true. I think the Native American uh, intensity was at an all-time high in New York at that time. And you can study that by looking at the Keefe's War between the Dutch settlers and the Native Americans in the 1640s. That's K-I-E-F-T apostrophe S, war. And so uh, I think it's interesting, though, that a lot of people... In Massachusetts, or not just in Massachusetts, but a lot of people like Roger Williams, who became a Baptist, he followed the example of Anne Hutchinson, and him, like others, thought that her being killed by Native Americans was just a conspiracy theory. So, what do you think about that? I mean, I'm sure you didn't walk in Sunday thinking, man, I'm going to hear about a conspiracy theory from 1643. So, I mean, what did you think about that? Well, I think that, yeah, I can see why it would be easy to think that. Probably people then just as as people now do what I like to call haystacking, you see an issue, a divided issue, and you're going to fall on one side or the other. You're going to pile up on the side that you agree with against the side that you disagree with. And so I, I think that I would be interested to know how much time passed before you know, because there wasn't as good as communication system back then. And exactly. Something, when when you have an issue in a church on Sunday morning, usually by Sunday night, the congregation's pretty polarized on it. it <laughs> news travel fast. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's the same way with, with any situation. But I can't help but think it would take a little bit longer for stuff like that to happen then, particularly in the move from uh, Massachusetts to New York. Yeah. It's not a you know, it's not far in terms of today's transportation. But back then, but that's back cross, then, cross, cross country move. And, yeah. And we talked about Sunday how New York was a wilderness at that time. So that's something to think about, too. Yeah. So you know, she, they were probably moving from uh, Massachusetts, which was probably a little more civilized, to, mm-hmm. uh, to really a, 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 an outlying area. Yep. Absolutely. So, Anne Hutchinson, that that whole situation, and so that makes Roger Williams the first Baptist in America, and so what that means is he decided that it was by grace through faith alone, and so that's how Baptists kind of got their start in America, and so Baptists or excuse me, Roger Williams founds the First Baptist Church in America, which was First Baptist Church in Providence, Rhode Island. And then what's really sad about this situation, Alan, this is where we leave from Roger Williams and get ready to talk about William Screven, is that while Roger Williams is the first Baptist in the colonies, he is also the, at the first ex-evangelical. So shortly after he founds the First Baptist Church in Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, which is believed to have begun in 1639, he later on describes himself as a seeker of truth and writes that there was no true church. So he recants all of his beliefs about Protestant Christianity. And so I think that's sad. We do see that a lot, but it is sad. First Baptist and first ex-evangelical. Any thoughts on that before we go to William Scraven? Well, I I think you see a lot of that today. A lot of people come into a church thinking what they're going to get out of it. And, you know, we've talked before that a lot of times you get out of it what you put in it. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, they come in half-hearted and it just doesn't meet what they think their needs are. Yep. 
And so they dabble a little while and then they move on. Yep. Either to a different church or to no church. Yep. Absolutely. So William Scraven comes along. And so we don't know a lot about William Scraven before he crosses the pond. That is the Atlantic Ocean, by the way. And so uh, he comes over here. And William Screven uh, was known by many in England as a very gifted young man, theologically, a good orator. And so a lot of the early Baptists, to kind of back up for a second, a lot of the early Baptists left Rhode Island, Maine, and, or excuse me, Rhode Island and went to Maine. So there's a lot of Baptists in Maine in the 1640s and 50s because of the ship, ship building industry. And so William Screven comes to America. He was born in England. Uh, He was led to Christ, made a profession of faith, was baptized in a Baptist church under the leadership of Thomas Collier in, I believe, 1681 or 82, uh, or excuse me, I think it was in the 1670s, and then in 1682, he was ordained by the First Baptist Church in Boston. And so somewhere during that time, William Scraven was going back and forth between First Baptist Boston and Maine. At some point in that time, he plants a Baptist church in Kittery, Maine. And so I'm not going into all the details that we did in class. If you want all those details, take it next semester and we'll give those to you. But he has a group of about 60 people, which was a very large church at that time in Kittery, Maine. They were all shipbuilders. And so he starts getting persecution at the church in Kittery, Maine, because he got involved in politics and made some enemies. And those enemies wanted William Screven out of Maine, so they knew if they got if they wanted him out of Maine, they had to get his church out of Maine. Uh, because at that time, when churches were to move, it wasn't like it would be today. If I were to move, which I'm not going to, by the way, but if I were going to move First Baptist Gaston to Albuquerque, New Mexico, most of you would probably go to another Baptist church around here, or I would hope so. But back then, they would pick up and move with the pastor because their church was everything. Right. And so those people would do that. Anyway, so he gets in some political trouble. He also gets in trouble with the residents of Kittery, Maine, because he rejects the idea of infant baptism, which we reject today. That is one of the foundational principles of being a Baptist. And so, but back in that time, everybody baptized infants. There were several reasons why. Number one, they did believe that when you baptize an infant, and that is not scriptural, by the way, that came across in the first and second century. But they believed if you baptize an infant, that infant was saved regardless. I mean, that infant was saved. And so that's not true, but they believe that. And so one reason they did believe that is they let their emotions affect their faith. And what I mean by that is many infants died very early on, uh, even if they made it through childbirth, you know, something like 60 to 70 percent of women that got pregnant, their babies didn't make it. So that was one thing, like as soon as baby came out, oh my gosh, this Sunday we're going to baptize them. That kind of thing. Uh, So, obviously, William Scraven faced a lot of criticism over that. And so, really, they left because of political trouble. And they left Kittery, Maine in 1696 to plant the First Baptist Church in Charleston. So, it was a transplant. They left because of political trouble. They also left because of the threat of Native Americans. That was a huge issue in Maine at the time. And then also economic stability. Believe it or not, by 1696 in Maine, the trees were starting to run out because of all the ships they have built. They need more trees. So the city of Charleston invites them. And this is a long story, but there were Anglican, there was an Anglican church, Presbyterian church, a French Huguenot, and a Jewish synagogue church in on Meeting Street in Charleston at in 1696. And so they invite the Baptists to come. Now, I want you to know the Baptists were the bottom of the rung when it comes to church in the 1690s and 1700s. And some would even consider us the bottom of the rung today. But that's another conversation for another day. And so Charleston, while and it was Charlestown then, by the way, but I'm saying Charleston. And so they come in 1696. And while that was a huge invite... It was also a slap in the face. And even today, you can go to Charleston and see what I'm talking about. All the churches on Meeting Street, the front of their church faces Meeting Street except the First Baptist Church of Charleston. They have a driveway from Meeting Street, but the back side of the church meets it while the front of the church faces another way. And so the leaders, the English leaders in Charleston, 
at Charlestown at the time said, yeah, you can bring your church here because we want to practice religious diversity. Charleston was the very first city in the United States to practice religious diversity, actually practice it. And so it took us 100 years to get to that point. And so they, they're like, okay, Baptist, you can come, but you're not equal to everybody because we're going to make sure the backside of your church is Demeeting Street. And so it was kind of a little bit of a slap in the face at that time. And so uh, anyway, the church still decided to go there because guess what? They had nowhere else to go. Uh, I don't really think that was a big concern to them like it kind of is to us today. So William Screven gets in there and gets started. He died in 1713. One of the main things to point out about William Screven that he led the First Baptist Church Charleston in was his love and ambition for church planning. He was an incredible church planner, did a great job, planted a lot of churches up and down the Ashley River, and so it was just really awesome. Most churches at that time just focused on getting bigger and not planting, but he focused on church planting. So that's a little bit about William Screven. I know we've kind of touched all over, but Alan, you were in the class Sunday. Your thoughts on this information and uh, what you think about all this? Well, I've been a Baptist all of my life, and it's not something that we really pay a lot of attention to anymore. You know, I had heard a little bit when I was way younger about our history, and, um, it, it, you know, it's not addressed, of course, in school. They touch on it just a bit, but they don't give you any names or dates or times. And I think that was an interesting part of it was to kind of see all of that come together and to know pretty much that every church in South Carolina was born out of the First Baptist of Charleston. That's right. That's right. So a lot of deep history. So we really have just scratched the surface. We did not go very deep today. But we wanted to give you a little bit of a pastor profile on William Scraven, give you a little bit to chew on. If you want to hear more about this, I can email you the notes that I wrote for our class this past Sunday. Still working on Sunday's notes. As you can imagine, it takes a good bit of time to do the research and get all that together. But uh, hope you're having a great Thursday. College game day is coming on Saturday, if you're a Gamecock fan, if that's relevant to you. But even if it's not, fall is in full swing pretty much. It's still a little warm, but it's been cool the last few nights. And so I uh, hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of the Menorah Podcast. This is the 32nd episode as we've done a pastor profile on William Scraven today. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to remind you to ask your friends to like and subscribe to the podcast. Uh, this is the podcast that seeks to share the light, speak the light, and send the light of Jesus Christ all across the internet waves. We hope you have a terrific Thursday.